Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on Working Together as a Team, Show Designer, Lighting Designer, and Lighting Director, presented by Stephen Douglas. My name is Laura Lawrence, and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions. We'll consolidate those and answer them at the end. This webinar is also being recorded, and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Stephen Douglas, the presenter for today's webinar. Stephen is a lighting and production designer with over 15 years of experience. He has toured venues ranging from clubs to stadiums with the Killers since 2005 and worked with a wide range of top talent, including Rage Against the Machine, Alicia Keys, Arctic Monkeys, Hozier, The Coors, and many others. And now I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Stephen. How are you doing? How's it going, everybody? Thanks for coming along and having a listen to this little chat. I thought we'd go through a little chat about working together as a team, show designer, lighting designer, lighting director, and what those roles entail. And then we'll have a little case study at the end of one of the shows that I've done recently. Um, I know some people may have seen Rob Koenig's webinar last week. Um, he did something a little similar in terms of the roles of lighting people, but hopefully it won't be too similar and uh, you'll get something out of it. Um, I'm not sure what the makeup of the audience is, so we'll try and go through everything as simply as possible. Apologies if it's stuff you already know and is, is too simplified. Um, as Laura said, uh, my name is Stephen Douglas. I'm a lighting and production designer based in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years now, um, primarily working with a band called Killers. I've uh, been with them for 15 years. And uh, yeah, so I've been very lucky to work with a lot of people uh, in all of these different roles myself and working with different show designers, different light designers, with different lighting directors and as each of those roles myself. So I thought we'd have a quick look at some of the stuff I've done uh, and just quickly talk through the roles I had on each of those shows um, and then we'll expand a little bit more. So I... Uh, it's not working. <laughs> We got nothing on there. We go. PowerPoint betraying me always. Uh, so as I said, I've been working with the Killers since 2005 um, uh, as lighting production designer, laser design. Uh, I've been involved in pyro, video content, everything uh, under the sun basically that you can do with one band. Um, I've also uh, worked with Raging Against the Machine. I uh, worked as lighting director uh, for Sooner Ruthier who was the designer on that tour, um, and she had to hand it over to me when she had some other shows to go do. Uh, Kylie Minogue, I worked with uh, a good friend of mine also, Nick Whitehouse, who was the lighting and production designer on that. Uh, I was lighting director again and programmer as well with Nick. Uh, Hosier, I was the production designer for, we just finished that a few months ago. Uh, the cores again in 2016-17, I was a uh, lighting designer and production designer for. Um, and then Aerosmith, which is the one that we'll probably talk about today, which is the residency that's currently running well. Not currently now, thanks to uh, thanks to COVID, but um, still in situ at the Park Theatre in Las Vegas. Uh, I was co-lighting designer on that along with Nick. Uh, Watch the Throne in 2011-12, I was lighting director and laser director. Uh, Guitar Hero Live, I know it says video game. I was uh, live, the live lighting designer for that. We uh, filmed all of the different levels of the game live and that it was all transposed into the game with the live footage. So, uh, Arctic Monkeys in 2005, I was lighting and production director or designer. And then Alicia Keys 2008 and then a bunch of other stuff that I've done. Um, so I thought we would just go through the roles themselves and discuss kind of the parameters. A lot of these things change from show to show. You know, it's very much based on who you're working with. Um, so first, I thought we'd talk about the show designer. So show designer, um, it, it sounds exactly like it is in the tenure. You're the show designer, the creative director sometimes as well. You'll be the person that everyone goes to. Uh, 
So you'll be the go-to person for every department. Every department will come to you. You'll be overseeing everything. Um, you will sometimes be able to be involved in the crewing of projects. So you might get to pick your lighting designers, your set designers, people that you work with on a regular basis sometimes, not always. Um, so sometimes you're in charge of a very big department full of people. Sometimes you are the one-man machine one person machine, excuse me, um, where you will be in charge of everything, but you're also the lighting designer, you're also the lighting director, you're also touring the show. Um, that happens quite often as well, especially if you're a younger person starting out with it, with a band, as I was with the Killers, you kind of will migrate from being just the lighting guy, and then you'll take on other roles as the production gets bigger. Excuse me one sec. You'll take on other roles as the production gets bigger and kind of absorb them into your into your wheelhouse. Um, I've I've done both sides. I've been lighting designer working with a show designer. I've been the show designer who's had lighting directors come in for me. Uh, last year with Hosier, there was a few shows right at the start of the tour where I was just finishing another project. Um, they overlapped by three or four shows, so I had I had to get somebody in to cover the first three or four shows, uh, which was interesting. Having putting somebody into a new tour that you've never met, that now has to go and implement your show without ever having seen you or gone to rehearsals or met you or seen the band. Uh, so it was yeah, a trial by fire for the guy who stepped in, Shaheen, but uh, he went in and killed it, and it was great. Um, down the opposite end of things on the cores a few years ago we had uh there was a few shows the halfway through the tour that i couldn't do because of another project so i stepped out and i had a, a gentleman called neil trinnell uh who who's worked with me quite a lot neil came in came out on the tour learned the show and then he took the show over from me and we swapped in and out because whenever uh either of us were, ne were needed so um yeah so Show designer will be, it's its a big, big role. You're going to be in charge of a lot, a lot of things. Uh, if we move on to lighting designer, um, again, this role quite, quite involved. Hopefully, if you, if you do find yourself in a situation of being called to be a lighting designer, you will not have to get involved too much with the set, with the video, with everything else. You'll just get to concentrate on your, your thing. But as I said, Combining roles is is very very normal thing in our business. Um, you will normally be involved from the very start, pitching ideas with the creative director, show designer. You'll talk through everything with the band, with the the artist, the management, and then it's your job to go and build the rig. So you then have to go design the rig around whatever pre-exists, whether it be set pieces, whether it be uh, audio constraints or requirements, band backline certain things that people need to do every uh certain things that people need to do everything within the show um usually two different people two different types of approach to being lighting designer some people will be a touring ld who will design the show and then tour it for its longevity however long that may be um they will always be hands-on operating the show every day some people would then you have the opposite side of it where you have people who are just purely designing LDs and they will design the show, go to rehearsals with you, sit in, program, you know, get the overall look. And when the product is final, you know, you do the first show, the first couple of nights or whatever, they will send the show on its way with a lighting director and they will step off and move on to another project. Um, both, both are very, very common. Uh, I've done both. I've been both um, quite locally. Um, and yeah, totally normal thing. Um, in terms of how you go about structuring your show, that's totally on a show dependent thing. I know a lot of people have questions about time code versus fully operated shows. Uh, the obvious benefit of time code is that if you are a designer who is sending a lighting director out on the show, Essentially, it's your timing that's playing back every night because you, you, if you were the one who recorded the time code, um, 
if you have a fully operated show, obviously that, that puts a different set of requirements on the operator. But I find it's always best to have somebody who can who can operate completely if the show is going to be time coded. Uh, I find that if you have somebody, you have to have somebody who operates the show as well, because time code is like everything else. It's technology and computers, and sometimes those things fail us. Um, the person on the tour uh, usually will be the one who will end up in constant contact with the artist. Um, so they will be the one implementing the, the, the LD's vision while the tour goes on. But they may be asked to add new songs. They may be add. To, they may be asked to uh, to change things. You know, and all of that is totally fine. It's it's at the end of the day, it's about keeping the artist and the management happy, and making sure that they get what they want out of it. Um, but as the person on the tour, you are representing the design team. Uh, so you will be the one who builds any sort of relationship with the artist. Um, and I think for sometimes it can be quite alluring to people to think, well, I'm going on the road and I'm going to become friends with these guys and hang out with this band. And, uh, it's not always the case. Sometimes it is. Um, but I find that it's always good to let the artist dictate the uh, constraints of the relationship. Um, and, you know, and just let them be the ones who decide where you, where you are in, in terms of your, your friendliness. Um, it's always good to remember that they are your boss at the end of the day. They are your employer. Um, so while I personally, while I wouldn't be calling artists on days off to go and have dinner, if they call me and suggest, hey, we're going to take everyone out for dinner, then, you know, absolutely go along. Um, I think that's uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, if we move on to lighting director, this is the least easily definable of the three roles for me um, in terms of how much input you can have. Can you inject your own ideas? Um, I think don't ever be afraid to uh, to put forth your ideas. I think, you know, it might get shot down. It might not. It could end up being a great thing in the show. But no, I don't think ever, never be afraid to speak up, but I think always do so respectfully, uh, knowing that the design team are the ones who have to make the final call, the final contribution and everything. I don't know if, ever, if anyone's been watching the the Last Dance documentary recently. Uh, it's about the Michael Jordan era of the Chicago Bulls. And that was it very much shows a team working together towards an end goal. But there's very definitely a, a defined figurehead, you know, in Jordan and in the coach who are pushing this along and have the fire and say, but the rest of the guys never are never afraid to speak up and speak their mind if they think it's for the better of the of the team. And creative process can be a lot like that as well. If you, you, you know, you need to speak up and speak your mind because everyone wants to, everyone wants their work to be seen and everyone wants their voice to be heard. But you got to remember that at the end of the day, there is a person um, who has to make the final decision on all this and has to be comfortable putting their name to it also as well as you. Um, a lighting director, the best thing you can have with a designer is trust. Uh, that designer's got to know that you've got his or her back when they leave the tour, but also they've got to trust your ability. They've got to trust your temperament. They need to know that you're capable of um, capable of executing their vision while they're while they're off on another project. Um, so I think, yeah, honesty, the relationship is is key. You know, people work with a lot of the same directors and designers a lot. I've been very fortunate to work with Nick Whitehouse a lot uh, over the years. Myself and Nick have known each other for probably about 18 years. Um, and we've worked together on a lot of projects. And, and how we work and how we interact changes on on a job-to-job -job basis. Uh, sometimes he, he will want to come in and dictate every cue, every move, every, excuse me, every look and, you know, because he has a very defined vision in his head of what he wants. Sometimes he'll just come in and go, look, the, there's the video content. Let's play along with that. You start writing cues. So 
the lighting director role can really vary between being lighting director and operator, you know, and a programmer. Um, again, it all depends on how much input you have, which again will be defined by your partnership within that team. Um, similar with uh, Sooner, when we did Rage Against the Machine, Sooner couldn't be on site uh, for any of the rehearsals or programming. Unfortunately, she was on another project. Um, so I stepped in and was given a very loose uh, definition of what they wanted the show to be. Um, so I had the parameters that I needed of these are the songs, they want you know no movement, no gobos, these are the colors we like, off you go. So I then got to program a whole show myself, um, as opposed to just being handed the show file and learning somebody else's show. Again, none of these are bad approaches or wrong approaches. They're all they're all perfectly valid and good approaches. Um, it just depends on the the show. But um, you've always got to remember that they you are the representative. If the artist comes to you and you're having a bad day, they 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 don't want to see that. They they want to know that you've had a great day. It's going to be a great show. Um, because they want, especially early in a relationship with a, with a new artist, if the designer has left who may have been there for a long time, they may have been the band's go-to person. They may have been their safety blanket. And now they're looking at a new face. As the lighting director, you've got to be the one to to be confident to say yeah i can do this and if they come to you and say hey we're going to play this song tonight that we haven't played in 10 years and we didn't do in rehearsals uh they've got to be confident in your reaction that you can put something into the show for that night and 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 do it with them um yeah that's that's about the definition stuff i think um i was going to have a look at a case study uh, which was the Aerosmith show that we just did uh, briefly. Well, so this show opened in April of 2019, uh, currently scheduled to still run. Um, but obviously with the COVID stuff, we don't really know what's happening right now. Um, it's a full residency show uh, sharing the same venue with Bruno Mars and Cher and Lady Gaga. Um, so it was quite a large creative team on this. There's a lot of people involved. So we had our producer, Steve Dixon, uh, creative director, who's Amy Tinkham. Amy was in charge of everything from the top down. She looked after everything, video content, lighting, movement. We had a lot of um, a lot of automation in the show. So we had a lot of set pieces that flew in and out, up and down. We had dancers in the pre-show there was a 30 minute uh, movie that projected onto the dance stage roll drops um which were uh brought so yeah so we had uh sorry we had characters who would roam the crowd all through the intro so they looked after all that uh but amy was the boss she was in charge of everything it was great uh then you had the art director jamie lou who was involved in from the very start, making some of the renders. She was hugely involved in all the artwork, all the, the video content, the general look and feel of the show. Uh, and then we had Scotty, who was our assistant director to Amy, uh, primarily uh, looking after the choreography of all the pre-show. Uh, I think we had about 16 or 20 uh, pre-show performers who would wander around. And it was, it was, it was very cool because even though it's a Las Vegas show, it still wanted to be a rock show, but we also didn't want it to feel like it was just another arena rock show. Uh, it's in kind of a, an intimate theater, 5200, I believe. Um, so from doors, there is a lot of atmospheric sound being played through, like you would see if you went into the Cirque du Soleil or you know, that style of show. It's very mood enhancing. Uh, we had some roll drops on the downstage, which were flown in, obscuring the stage. And then there was a 30 minute video uh, history of the band that played. So all through that pre-show, while people were coming in, taking their seats, there was this team of performers who would move around the theater and interact with the audience. Um, 
as I said, Scotty mainly would look after that. They would interact with the screens also as well. Some of the content uh, they would react to specifically. Some of the some of the content matched up to how they were dressed, what they were wearing. Um, so it was quite an immersive thing to come into if you thought you were just walking into a rock and roll show. Uh, then we had a production designer, Josh Zangan. Uh, Josh is one of the, the many people on this who make up uh, Fireplay, who are the uh, creative producers of the show. Uh, Josh has been set designer for many uh, Broadway and off-Broadway theater, uh, a lot of rock and roll, Justin Timberlake, Kali Minogue, lots and lots of stuff. Um, so he was our great set designer on this and involved in some of the props and stuff like that as well. Uh, then we had our the lighting designers, there was myself, and then there was Nick Whitehouse. Um, Nick was, they were, Fireplay were brought in as a team to design a, the Vegas experience for the show, essentially. Um, so myself and Nick were, were splitting the design, uh, the design responsibilities, because obviously Nick being the CEO of Fireplay is also quite busy with running that side of things with the production of the show also. Um, and then we had our lighting director who is the the legend that is Cosmo Wilson. Uh, Cosmo, we knew from day one, obviously Cosmo has been with Aerosmith a long time, um, but we knew from day one Cosmo was gonna be involved. It was great because he's such a resource of of just knowledge and knowing what the band want and you know translating those again like i said earlier being the person on the tour having that relationship with the artist to a certain extent you almost become like the translator you almost have your own um your own shorthand how you talk to each other and cosmo was was great for relating hey okay when when steven says uh this he this is what he means so you know, it was great being able to, uh, to to harness his knowledge, and we knew going in that there was a set list, a predefined set list, and that was the Vegas show. But we also knew that this is a rock and roll band who are going to want to change things. Um, so all through the time when we were programming the the Vegas elements of the show, Cosmo, we would have him programming every other song he thinks they could possibly play on any given night. So that he knew if they threw in a song last minute, he had something in his console, a busk page, and away we go. So that was really beneficial for us and uh, to have him involved. Um, and then we have Kelly, uh, Kelly Spixel, who is our special effects and laser designer. Uh, there's a lot of lasers in this, and obviously being Aerosmith, a lot of pyro, a lot of you know explosions and dry ice and smoke and stuff like that. Uh, we had our content creation people, Olivia Sebeski, uh, Pixamondo, and Jamie Liu, who again, our art director. Uh, Pixamondo, uh, our company, I believe, involved with Game of Thrones and a few other things like that. And Olivia is a great content director who obviously did Aerosmith and has recently done um, Hootie and the Blowfish, uh, which is some more great content as well. And then we had our laser programmer, who's Will Kent. Um, Will was on site with us all the way through rehearsals, programmed a lot of the lasers, either off his own back again, like I said earlier, about a lighting director who would, rather than sitting around and waiting for stuff to be dictated to him, Will just decided, I'm going to program a few things, and then we used all that as a starting board. So he showed us some looks, and we're like, oh, yeah, we really like that. And him being a laser person, he knows more about what his fixtures can do. Uh, than we would. So he was able to show us things that we maybe might not have thought of to do on our own. Um, so that's, and then we had uh, video people. We had Rich Porter, who was our D3 disguise person, Colleen Wittenberg, who was our uh, video director and projectionist. Um, and they were the main, the main core of people who would be there on the long overnight programming sessions. Um, so the the initial pitch uh, was done obviously by Fireplay. Um, this is one of the original renders uh, that was shown to the band. So we have this uh, A-shaped uh, thrust, if you like, coming off the main stage. 
and then this giant ramp that comes out into the audience um, and then the the Aerosmith logo so that is actually four pieces so you, you have Aerosmith you have the circle behind and then each of the two sets of wings and all of them are moving and tracking on different axes so the wings would open and close to reveal the video wall and the Aerosmith and the circle would fly up and down um, and then this walkway is actually uh, buried in the roof of the theater for the entire show until the last song of the encore and it comes down and the band go up there to play so we use it underneath we have a lot of uh, a lot of fixtures strapped to the underside of it that we use throughout the show for audience lighting um, then getting into the design process which is when I kind of came on board um, we knew we knew we were going to have a lot of a lot of factors uh, a lot of um, as we can see here there's a lot of automation so the automation that's out over the tip of the thrust that's the catwalk that I spoke about previously and the ones over the stage that you can see all marked in red uh, they were all automation trusses for the various symbols and stuff to go up and down the long truss that you see on the very downstage of the stage is the roll drops so these roll drops came up and down in different heights throughout the show for uh, front projection so some shows some songs they would be in really low you would just see the band below it some only side ones were in some only this one was in so they they were very dynamic um but having all of this in situ before you even start designing the rig makes it interesting because this centerpiece over the stage uh the kind of h shape for lack of a better term uh that takes up a lot of the space where you would traditionally put your overhead lighting trusses uh so this would be where the circle lived and where the aerosmith logo lived they flew off these points obviously that creates a big challenge you then lose all of the uh, all of the overhead space that you would normally go okay let's put a truss there let's put a truss there so we we started with this kind of fanned side light uh, idea where these side trusses just get longer and longer as they move off stage um, and it was really a case of finding places to put fixtures um, that we wouldn't obscure the automation the automation was the, the big deal it was a, a huge thing on the show and luckily so it it ended up looking absolutely amazing um the red trusses that you see are all house uh lighting trusses so they were all in house lighting trusses um we used a lot of the house lighting fixtures we used um basically everything they had and then and then we brought in everything else that's in gray we brought in all the automation trusses and the lighting trusses um so from there, this is essentially what the lighting plot looks like. So upstage, we have this huge run of fixtures uh, with a lot of uh, rear follow spots in the middle. Uh, we have a big collection of five trusses over the top of the Aerosmith logo that would come beaming through the logo. And the side truss, red trusses that you see are um, key light positions for all the upstage uh, band members so you have the drummer uh, you had uh, a keyboard player a back and singer a saxophone player uh, a string section for a couple of songs so we needed we knew we needed a lot of extra key light to uh, to make sure everybody was covered all of the downstage primary guys were were lit with follow spots for the whole show anyway um, and then we had our floor package which was actually quite small for this um we had a bunch of martin viper uh air effects the viper uh there's a lot of them in, in the flown rig as well um which you can see there uh we had yeah a, a lot of the the air effects uh i'm a big fan of the viper series of fixtures i've used that as kind of my workhorse um, my workhorse fixture on a lot of tours they're robust and they stand up to treatment they're you know very rarely fail and yeah and no, it's just a, a great fixture that I, that I really enjoy using so 
it was an obvious choice to put onto something like this where we need a lot of big beams, a lot of punch to, to deal with the amount of lumen coming off the video wall, uh, but also then be able to do some lovely air, you know, air movements and beams and, and gobos. Um, but as you can see here, there's not a lot of floor fixtures. We were quite limited on our space because of how much uh, the band liked to move around. So uh, the singer, Stephen, is on wireless mic. He goes everywhere. So everything had to be tidy and tucked away and uh, still capable of, of hitting, its, hitting, its, hitting its intended target. Uh, we had some small fixtures on the A there. You see them. Uh, they were actually built into uh, the piano. The piano was part of the floor of the deck. Uh, and it then rose up out of the uh, out of the floor with a set of stairs that actuated up out of the floor as well. And we had these lights built into Perspex Top and CO2 and Cryo and lots of little toys that came out of it. Um, and then we had these side walls. So these, um, these side ladders, we had three each side, um, which were doing our big wide looks. Uh, they became a almost a plotting nightmare for the stage management people who were calling the cues. Uh, Brett, who ended up calling the show, did a great job with it. But in order for them, in order for the side wing set pieces to open, two of these had to fly up into the roof. So we had lots of cues where these lights were all on for a whole song. Halfway through, the lights would go off so they could fly up so that the wings could open and then they would fly back in and then come back on. Um, so it, it proved to be a huge logistical movement challenge, um, but the stage management people and the automation people just nailed it. They were absolutely great. Um, and then we have a front view. So this is this is the front view that kind of shows everything. Uh, as you can see, the circle, which is the the Aerosmith logo, the two wings, and then the side pieces. You see the the ladders and towers that I was talking about. So you can see how it became quite a design process to shoehorn all of these things in. Uh, we we're very lucky in that we knew it wasn't going to really tour. Uh, there was a version of the show which went to the East Coast uh, for some shows and casinos over there, but uh, I don't think they brought this full, the full production. I think they brought a, a reduced version of it because of the smaller rooms. Um, this is very much built for this venue, um, which which was great. You know, normally when you sit down to design a show, you're looking at, okay, I got to get this into so many trucks. I've got to get it in and out of buildings really quickly, um, which is still all true. I mean, we we were very lucky in the first the first build that we had a few days to build, so that was great. Um, but I knew we knew going into further reinstalls because uh, normally they would do three weeks at a time, load out, and then as I said, one of the other artists who were playing in the venue would come in, do their little runs, and then we would come back in with our little show. Um, so we knew in those turnarounds when we weren't teching the show properly, we knew there was going to be time constraints that it would have to load in quickly anyway. And of course, truck space is always an issue, no matter what, whether you're driving hundreds of miles or 10 miles down the road in Las Vegas. Um, but to be able to be given a a, ca a blank canvas where this is the room, this is what you're designing to, was was, an, was a different challenge. I'm used to designing to a an arena, and you have to fit into that arena every day. Um, so of course you take one arena as your challenge, whether it be Madison Square Garden or Staples Center or the O2 in London or whatever, you take that and you go, well, I designed my show to fit in there. Of course, then it's not gonna fit when you go to such and such a show in Omaha or Glasgow or something like that. You know? So to not have to worry about those constraints this time was, was really good, it was quite freeing. Um, and allowed us to push the envelope a little bit on things that we did with it. Um, so once we had the design signed off, we we obviously it was sent out to to vendors, 
uh, by Dennis Gardner, who was our production manager. And uh, they came back with all the bids. PRG ended up providing. Uh, they were also Aerosmith's long-term um, provider on tour, so it was great. It was great, and Cosmo was able to get his crew chief that he wanted, so it all worked out really well. And um, then we moved on to the programming end of things. Uh, once everything was signed off and ready to go. So myself and Nick sat down at his house uh, for about four or five days and programmed the show in MA3D. Um, that was mainly because we wanted to, uh, we just wanted to have something. We knew we were going into rehearsals in Vegas for a few days. Uh, so we knew we'd have four or five days in Vegas off our four or five days in the theater in Vegas, but we also knew we'd have about two weeks, 10 days off-site in Vegas with the rig as well. So we, we had the benefit of time. Time was definitely on our side, but we didn't want to turn up to the show with nothing. Um, so we sat down in, in Nick's office and went through about four days or so of programming. Uh, we got looks in for every song. Uh, the guys at Fireplay were able to and were able to build these great MA3D um, graphics that you can see here. We were able to move the automation within the MA3D. And, and again, they just put it into this box standard arena model for us, but to be able to sit down and program all these looks and know that when you turn up to rehearsals, uh, you're gonna be able to do something straight away. If somebody, you know, management or an agent or a band member turn up on, on day one of programming, you don't want to be caught and say, I haven't got anything done yet. Could you, you know, come back in three days? You want to be able to just call something up and hit go and 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 fire away. Um, so that was great. So we were able to sit down with the music. We had all the recordings that the band did of rehearsals. We had all the video content. So we were able to match our color palettes to video. Uh, obviously, we knew once we got to rehearsals, there would be there would be issues, there would be changes, things in the set list change. You know, sometimes the band don't feel, okay, I don't feel like doing this song into this song. So things like that change. Um, and sometimes it songs get cut or changed or moved for technical reasons. Okay, well, we're moving this piece of set too many times now because of where it needs to be. So let's consolidate these songs and, and go for a look um, all these things happen in rehearsals all the time. That's why we rehearse. It's it's great to iron all these things out without an audience. Uh, so for rehearsals, we went to a little uh, casino arena outside of Vegas, and this is our beautiful site that we were treated with every morning. Empty casino full of uh, full of um, slot machines with nobody uh, nobody doing anything on it. Um, we went into rehearsals. As always, there's always issues. We had problems with trim height. We had, you know, I say problems, it was challenges. Um, challenges with not being able to move things properly the way we wanted to. We didn't have enough enough space to put the, the logo up. Uh, but again, it's the next step in the evolution of how you, how you approach the show. You know, you can show band members renders and you can show them photographs and they'll look at it and go, yeah, that's a pretty picture and that looks great. But people, it's really only until they see things in, in their, you know, in real life that they, they get, they see the, uh, the end effect really. And, and that goes for every band. I'm not specifically talking about anyone here. Um, so this is Amy and Josh showing uh, Joe, one of the band members around the ramps that go up around the back of the drum riser and stuff like that. So as I said, you can draw these things and you can show them renders and they go, oh yeah, that's okay. And then you show people the real thing and they go, oh, okay, now, yeah, okay. Now I see how long I need to get from here to there uh, for this little piece of, if I'm gonna play a guitar solo up here, I know how long I need to, to move myself. And then they will always find little ideas you know, we then connected these risers that you see on the left-hand side of the photo that Josh is standing on. Uh, you see these risers, they ended up connecting to the VIP bar, which we had on stage. 
So the band were then able to go out, walk out these risers, and then walk out onto the VIP bar and really interact with the side of stage VIP people, um, which was great. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so we spent about two weeks there um, rehearsing and programming. There's a lot of long nights, a lot of a lot, a lot of rehearsals. Uh, there's a lot of cues in the show, obviously, with with it being such a a Vegas kind of based spectacular, if you like. Um, but then we were we were off. We moved to the theater, so we moved into Vegas properly into the park, the Park MGM, uh, which is the old uh, Monte Carlo, I believe it used to be called the hotel. Um, so this was the park theater. Um, Obviously, with being an install, we had the challenges again, all of the automation, so all of the cables, everything needed to go into the roof. That's what you see here is looking down from the catwalk uh, down to the floor of the theater. Um, everything went up into the roof. So there's a great rigging bay there, luckily, which is good. But dimmer world, everything lived on the roof uh, up in the attic. We were... Yeah, we were here for maybe four days, five days before the first show, um, which again, you know, we we used all of that time every every minute we possibly could. We you know, we sleep for a few hours, and but this was the first time when we saw when we saw a lot of the factors of the show. It was the first time we had full trim. It was the first time the roll drops were able to move because again they move at a certain speed so we then have to rejig some cues or choreography knowing okay well in rehearsals because they were 12 feet lower it took four seconds it was four seconds quicker getting to the top now we've got a factor in that time change the cueing you know uh but again that's much easier than starting from scratch uh with a show like this if you were to start from scratch when you got into the venue it would be it would be a nightmare uh, we also had the full PA for the first time uh, in rehearsals. We didn't have PA. We didn't have a full PA system. Um, they were doing a THX uh, certified audio on this. So it was nine hangs of PA. Um, so it was essentially like surround sound THX. Um, so there's nine main hangs in front of the stage. The issue we had, of course, is that because they're zoning certain instruments to certain PA cabinets, it's not just like one big PA where it's all blasting at you. So we had some issues with positioning of the trusses that lived over the thrust uh, because they would a fixture would be blocking a, a cabinet and the guitar may only be coming out of that cabinet for this bit of the song. So it was we had a few little things we had to change on site. Again, this is totally totally a normal thing to do, um, but. Again, it's it's the working as a team thing, whether it be you know, as our production manager, our production coordinators, with Amy, our director, all the lighting department, um, and then the PA people and the guys from THX, we found a solution of where we could move the trusses to um, to make to make the audio work for everyone. Uh, it was also the first time we had the house fixtures that we knew we were going to be using. Uh, it was the first time we had follow spots for everything. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of when you program a show in a rehearsal room, you're really close. And we were 40, 50 feet from the downstage edge in rehearsals. And then when we got into this theater, where all of a sudden we're 100, 120 feet away. Um, it changes your outlook on, on certain cues, some things that you think were big enough now aren't big enough some things that you thought were super overpowering so you change them in rehearsals now maybe aren't quite as big uh, because you now have to inhabit the space that the show lives in it was also the first time that we had these fellas so these are our inflatable toys for a song called toys in the attic uh, these would come down out of the roof for one song and then fly back up and that was it really um, yeah, but again, rehearsals is the first time we saw these. Um, so when we were doing cues on these in uh, in the pre-production rehearsals off-site, we never had these guys. So we were just shooting lights at air, uh, hoping it would look okay when we got to rehearsals. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, people go, oh, well, we could have them move up and down and undulate and you, know, you got to write in tracking cues and stuff like that. So, but it was good. It was an interesting challenge um, to to get these down low enough that we could really make them impactful for people in the lower down seats, uh, but then also not block sight lines for people up top, not block follow spot shots. Um, so a lot of choreography went into it. Um, yeah, and then even right up to the last night, we were writing cues, changing things, as you always do. Uh, and then we came to the show, uh, opening night. As always there is, there's always some issues. There's always hiccups. We had a little hiccup on opening night with some follow me stuff. Um, but luckily I was, I was at the console with Cosmo, Cosmo operated. Uh, I stood behind him. I was able to jump onto the spare console and reset some fixtures for him. Um, and, you know, typically, of course, it happened during the uh, during the opening of the show. But I think we got away with it. I don't think anyone saw it. I think the excitement of the audience covered it all up. So uh, this is the, the intro of the show. And this is, I think, what makes it all worthwhile. You see the roll drops. You'll see them move up. And you'll see some of the automation stuff. Um, again, all the work that you've done, all this teamwork that's gone into it, it totally, I think, is worth the end product for when the audience see that first moment now as the as the drapes go up and the band are revealed. It's uh, it was it was a very cool moment to be a part of. I mean, obviously they're a legendary band and. Um, yeah, no, it was it was a very beneficial experience, I think. Um, we have some photos from the show here. Um, these were all taken by either Josh Zangan, production de uh, production designer, or uh, Aaron Perry, who's Aerosmith's um, social media guy. Um, so just to show you kind of a couple of different looks through the show. Um, obviously, we have the circle now in a down position. We have these two roll drops in. I think we had we had seven roll drops in total. Um, and again, throughout the the rehearsal and creative process, it is a it's a trial and error. You can go, okay, well, this is a great idea, and I love how this looks. And like I said, with a band member, same for us. Not until you get on site and you look at it and go, eh, yeah, that doesn't, uh, doesn't that doesn't really work. Okay, let's so let's rejig this and try this. And uh, this was for a song called "Stop Messing Around," which is one of Joe Perry's solo songs. Um, we then had obviously our pyro, um, some some plane jet stuff. Uh, you can see the video wall upstage now as the wings have opened out. Um, yeah, just Amy and and the creative director people and, and Josh and everybody and all the people at Fireplay came up with a really immersive and, and multi-layered show um, that I think was, was really great. And I mean, I'm very thankful that they asked me to, to come on board to help with it. Um, we also then had the lasers and the lasers were uh, some people said they were vastly underused. I think they were, I think they were used really well. Uh, Will, Kent, and Kelly are, are laser people. Uh, I think they did a great job. We only used the lasers for maybe I think four, three or four songs out of twenty. Um, and I think the impact they had was huge. Uh, and then going back to that first render that we showed you earlier, here's the similar. The similar moment, I guess, from the show um, in real life. Uh, this is always always interesting being at front of house because just under this balcony where the where the uh, catwalk is reaching is where front of house is. So you're uh, always always prepped for Stephen to throw a one of the t-shirts at you or something like that while he was up there having a bit of fun. Um, yeah, I mean that's it really. It's um it was a really good a really great show to be a part of. I was very very thankful and lucky to be a part of it, but I think it shows what you can really achieve with um with working with a team. 
we had a great team on this. Everybody, everyone got to put in their, their two cents. Everyone was listened to and some ideas stuck, some ideas didn't. Some of my ideas stuck, some of my ideas didn't, some of Amy's didn't, some of, you know. So there was, it was a really good experience, I think. Um, Brad or Laura, I don't know if you have any questions or anything you want to go through. We do have some questions that have come in. Um, the first question is asking, what is the biggest challenge of working with the same band for 15 years? <laughs> um, trying to keep it fresh, obviously, uh, I guess. Yeah. Um, there's only so many ways you can like the same song, I guess. And uh, some of those, for, I mean, obviously it's it's referring to the killers for me. Um, there's only so many ways you can like Mr. Brightside. Um, so again, it's it's about coming up with a different approach to things. I mean, the band sometimes will take a different approach to it. Uh, they have changed songs up. They've gone for semi-acoustic versions and full acoustic versions. They've so they've evolved songs and changed things they've thrown in little extra guitar solos and breaks and to keep it fresh for themselves and that's kind of what we need to do as well we i always try and look at what i've done before and go okay how can i make this make this different um again a lot of that can be dictated by the overall production design um which for me then is always built off what the current vibe of the album or the artwork or the tour that you're now doing um we've had lots of very different looks throughout the course of the of, of a band's career so that can always be a good springboard as well you're not going to light a, a, a song in tungsten if the album artwork is based on the cover of tron <laughs> you know it's uh so i always find that that's a good a good starting point is what your core objective is um and that really, for me, always goes back to what the band are trying to achieve with that album cycle. Okay, the next question is asking, how did you get into the concert touring industry and what would you recommend for someone just starting out? Um, I started doing this uh, straight out of school, pretty much. Um, I went to school for two, I went to college for two years. I did a diploma in theatrical stage management and design. Uh, but it was a lot more geared towards theater. Uh, there was very little concert uh, stuff to it, but I knew what I wanted to do was more concert related. Um, so I started working with some local bands around Dublin, uh, started harassing bands just to give me a day's work for free. You know, I didn't even want to be paid at the start. It doesn't apply now, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I would just harass local bands and go, look, give me a day. I need experience. I need to get in. And, and that's, for me, that's how I found it worked best for me. It was, I got into the, the, the industry at a very low level. I worked local crew. I worked at a lot of venues around Dublin and made contacts from there. Obviously, now there's a lot more different ways you can go about things. Um, whether you come out of RADA or Full Sail or any of these, LIPA or any of these, these great schools that, that, do courses directed towards our our industry you're going to have more contacts there i think than somebody just calling fresh um yeah just try and get in and do as much as you can make as many contacts as you can never be afraid to go up to people at the end of shows and say hey can i pick your brain for a minute um i i get that occasionally uh that people will come up to me at the end of a show and they'll they'll have some questions and I mean, I'm I'm always happy to talk to anyone about it. I'm very grateful for ending up being able to make a career out of this. I'm I'm happy if I can help anyone else to do that. Um, you'll see my contact at the end. If anyone wants to get in touch or reach out, feel free. No problem at all. Um, but yeah, get make as many contacts as you can. Talk to as many people. Leave an impression as much as you can. Um, I got my first full no, let's say full time gig uh, at the Olympia Theatre in Dublin because I'd been harassing their local band and they were they just said look don't 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 come to these little small club gigs we're doing come when we do the Olympia so I went okay I took that as an invitation and I turned up at the door I went in I tried to work my ass off for the day and at the end of the day I asked the chief electrician I was like who do I give a CV to and he said I don't do CVs but I have your phone number 
And about two weeks later, a week later, he called me. Uh, a follow spot operator had let him down at the last second for a show that night. What was I doing? So I just, I was on my way to my evening job after college and I got off the bus, crossed the street, got on the bus going the opposite way into the city. And I did the show that night and called in sick to my, my real job. Um, and that's, that's how it started for me. Um, but again, there's lots of different ways you can go work for theater. You can go work for a crew company. There's a lot of really good crewing companies around now. Uh, you can go work for a lighting vendor, set vendor, stage vendor, audio vendor, anyone like that. Uh, but yeah, getting your foot in the door is the hardest part. Um, but what I, I always found that once you get your foot in the door and people see what you're capable of work-wise and as a person, because that's also very important, is having a good relationship with people that you work with in this business, because it is a lot of it is references and you know people going, oh, I need a set guy for this. Do you know anyone? You go, yeah, yeah, I know this person. You put them in touch. And off you go. Uh, so yeah, no, I'd, I would definitely try to get your foot in the door somewhere. And it worked for me, I think. Okay, the next question is asking, are there any similarities or differences you didn't expect to run into when working with video game design as opposed to live production? Yeah, yeah, there was actually. Um, I, I came late into the Guitar Hero project because they were, they were already filming uh, with another uh, another designer, and for one reason or another, things just weren't working. Uh, they wanted to make a little change. So uh, I, again, like I just said about references, I had been filming, I had filmed a concert DVD with the director of the Guitar Hero, uh, the Guitar Hero project. So he called me and said, "What are you doing? Can you can you come to London tomorrow?" And so I, I went over and we had a chat and. That's how I ended up in there was, again, having worked with this director before. Um, in terms of challenges, yes, uh, because of the way it was filmed, uh, the whole thing was filmed with a motion control camera. So we had a real band on stage, some real audience and a green screen and a motion control camera, which was your first person view for the game. So that was what you saw when you played the game. Uh, the issues we had were things like shadows, reflections. if if the uh, camera turned to look at the guitar player on stage right, we would have to kill all the lights on stage left because we couldn't have this giant hulking mechanical shadow cast across the stage because that would take people out of the moment and make them realize that it is this giant camera that is uh, that is doing the performing and not you as the person. And that was the idea of the game that you felt immersed in the footage. Uh, again, things like when the camera would go up and look at the drummer, you would always see the reflection of the camera lens in the high gloss drum skin. So then we would have to take a fixture and point it over the top of the lens to light to light the uh, the drum skin enough that it blew out and you didn't see reflections. So I wasn't expecting stuff like that going into it. Um, I thought, here we go, we're just going to go in and film a load of songs and we're going to throw it into a video game. But, so it was a, a quick quick learning curve, but a very re very rewarding one, I think, as well. All right, the next question is asking, how closely do you work with the laser and video designers during the previs stage? Um, during previs, again, like I said earlier, all of this is is project based. You know, you might be the person who's doing all of it. You might be the person only doing one tiny little little facet of it. Um, on Aerosmith, we knew we knew going in uh, that the video was going to be a huge push it was going to be a big a big part of the show because it was going to tell the story of the band throughout the show as well uh, as well as just being visual reinforcement it had a had a purpose uh, and the laser is also you know we we didn't really delve into that too much until we got to rehearsals uh, we did some previous images of some laser ideas but as I said we got there and then will started well, our, our laser operator started putting in all these ideas and all of a sudden it changed the things that we were thinking about doing because we had, I've done lasers a lot on shows. So maybe I had my own ideas of, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then I saw the things Will could do on his laptop, which we could then just trigger 
I thought, yeah, no, this is this is definitely the better way to go. Um, if it's if it's the one the one person machine that I spoke about at the start, then yeah, you're obviously you're involved in in everything from the very very start because you're 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 doing all of it. Um, but yeah, no, the video is definitely always has to be taken into account because it's the screens are such a big thing now. They dictate the the energy, they dictate the vibe of a song now. A lot of them will dictate the color palette as well because obviously lights are much easier to change than video content. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to you definitely have to consult and and discuss everything in advance for sure. The next question is asking: As a lighting designer, how do you find new lighting directors to tour your shows? Word of mouth, definitely. Um, as I said, um, Shaheem, who operated, um, I was here for me last year for a few, uh, for some, a couple of legs. He came to me through um, a couple of other people. I know Sooner had used him on some shows. Dan Hadley had used him. Um, so I caught, I'd heard about this this guy, and I was like, oh, he sounds like he's sounds like he's pretty good. Uh, so you call your friends and go, hey, you worked with this person, how are they? And they they give glowing reviews. So you go, okay, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Um, other people I've met on festivals. Um, I see people at festivals who are the house LD or something, and you know they go, oh, I I, I tour as well, and I do this, and I do that, and, you know. You just get imp you're impressed by their knowledge and and you know you give people a shot and give people a chance. But yeah, a f word of mouth mainly for me uh, is usually the one that I go to. Okay, the next question is asking, what lighting desk do you use for your shows? Uh, primarily uh, Grand Amé. Um We're on the Grand Amé two at the moment. Obviously, we toured the Grand Amé three. Uh, still running the two software at the moment, uh, but I started I started on Avalite's Pearl. I've toured with a Whole Hog Two, Whole Hog Three, Whole Hog Four, uh, a V Six Seven Six, uh, Avalite's Diamond Four. So I've, I've been through a lot of them. Um, they're to me they're another tool, um, in the same way that you you have your certain preferred fixtures. Like I spoke earlier about using the Viper a lot, it's not always going to be that the Viper is available to you. So you've got to be able to put on a show with another fixture or another different type of light. It's always good to know multiple desks, I think. Um, you may not know them all to the same level, and you'll always have your favorite. I mean, personally, I always have my favorite, but um, it's always good to know multiple platforms. I think uh, at the end of the day, they're they're a tool and they're an instrument in in how you do your job. Uh, so the more knowledge you have of different instruments, different tools, I think will will only be better for you and stand to you. Okay. The next question is asking: How did you split the design workload with Nick on the Aerosmith show? Um. There was no defined there was no defined thing. We really kind of worked at it together. He obviously, as I said, with him being uh, the CEO of Fireplay and also um, being involved in the creative production of the show as well, his energy was going to be split between all these different facets. So I was there primarily to be to run the lighting end of things in terms of design. Um, but obviously, with Nick being heavily involved because that is his main role as well. Um, we, yeah, we had no real defined thing. It wasn't like, okay, you do the drawings and I'll do the previs and you do the programming. It was very fluid. We would jump in and out of things, you know, when we were program, you know, the, the, the design process with the drawing started with us firing vector works files back and forth. We sort of gone, Hey, what about this arrangement of trusses? And what if we did this? And what if we moved this? And, and the end plot just became a, a hybrid of, of two sets of ideas. Um, and then in terms of programming, we would sit putting songs in and we, we'd each take a pass at each song on the same queue stack, if you like, um, and just, change things and refine things and yeah it was it was very very collaborative and we also have two different styles in terms of 
programming and shows and, and how we see things, which is always good. Um, so we were able to go, look, I think this is kind of more your type of song, or this is more my song, or, and then there was, again, there was songs like that where we thought, oh, this is definitely a, a Nick song, and I ended up doing it, or this is definitely a Steven song, and he ended up doing it. So there was no, we didn't define anything, it was definitely just working together, but we, like I said, we've known each other for so long, we've worked together on so many projects that we're able to do that. We we almost have that shorthand thing where we can slip in and out of ideas together um, without both of us needing to be hovering over the console at all times. Okay, this next question I'm assuming is coming from a friend of yours. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> What's the muddiest festival site in Europe and would you throw a handful of mud at Dan Hadley if you could? <laughs> That, that could come from a lot of people. I'm guessing it's probably coming from Tess. Um, the muddiest festival site in Europe. Oh, I don't know. It all depends. Uh, Glastonbury is always a classic. Um, uh, Oxygen Festival it used to be about 25 minutes from where I am right now. That was usually a mud bath tea in the park in Scotland. If it rains, those places can be just hell. Um, and would I throw a fistful of mud at Dan Hadley? I would not. I would throw a fistful of hugs at Dan Hadley. He's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next question is asking, do you prefer shows operated manually or via time code? Um, I don't think there's a personal preference thing. Uh, I think it's, it's what's required. Uh, we did a lot of time code on Kylie. Um, because it's such a heavily choreographed show. Um, there was certain things that, and, and there was so many cues, there was so many little hits and, and, and little musical notes, and there was cues to go with everything, that some, some songs were just impossible to, it would be impossible to operate them. Um, personally, most of my own shows that I tour with, I operate live. Um, that's purely because the bands that I work for don't, don't, use time code they they don't want to be locked to a certain um to a certain structure for the song they want to know if they decide one night hey we're going to extend the guitar solo by, by four bars that they can do that and they're not locked to this stringent time code thing um so i can just play i mean they know i'll be able to just play along with them all right, and I have a note from Tess. She wants to be clear that that was not from Tess. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know who it's from now. Uh, do you have a pal I'm, named Leif Dixon? Oh, uh, Leif, yeah, yes, 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 <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Leif, Leif worked with Dan a lot on Foo Fighters, and he's a programmer extraordinaire on stuff like the Chili Peppers and Weezer, and yeah, really, really good guy. Hi, Leif. <laughs> so nice of everyone to join us. Um, we just have a couple more questions. Uh, what is a favorite sure. color combination you use as a lighting designer? Um, I'm always partial to Congo and red together. I don't know why. Um, I just find it really kind of imposing and foreboding. Um, but again, if, if it's a big happy song, then that's not going to work for it. So uh, it'll have to go out the window for that song, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, just as a, as a as a a way two colors work together, I, I really like that. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't have any go to really. For me, it's always okay. We'll sit down, and listen to the song, and decide where in the color palette I kind of think it should be, um, and push forward from there. And again, like I said, you could get on site, and the artist could go, "I don't get why that song is blue. You know, the song needs to be this." because everybody has a different idea and a different vision for how they want they want it presented. And at the end of the day, you got to listen to what the artist wants because it's, it's their creative vision that you're, you're, you're in charge of and you're looking after, I guess. All right, and then the last question, I think this is um, asking in relation to your, your Aerosmith show, how much control did the show director have over your lighting design choices and what did you have to give up? Um, not massively. Um, we were, like I said, in the previous state when we were programming at Nick's house, we had the full pass of the show before we got to rehearsals. 
Um, but we've had conversations with the show director and talked through certain things. And I mean, the, I hesitate to say we gave up things because it's not a it's not a fight. But the things that you would have constraints. So we knew going in, okay, well for this song, the roll drops three, four, seven, and eight are going to be in because that's where the video content's been playing. Okay, so now you know in your head, okay, well, I've lost these these groups of fixtures in this position. They can't now can't do that. So it's just a case of working around the all the elements. Um, I don't think we ever really hit a situation where it was a case of any anyone had to overrule anyone. I think it was just, yeah, makes it sound all very happy clappy, but it was genuinely um, quite an easy process to to make all those parts come together because everyone was open to the discussion. Okay, wonderful. Um, that was it for questions. Uh, Stephen, did you have a slide with your contact yep. information? Yep, okay. there we go. All right, so if anybody has additional questions and they want to reach out to Stephen directly, um, his contact information is up on the screen right now. And I wanted to thank you, Stephen, for presenting. This was really great, super interesting, and it was fun that your friends attended as well to participate. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone who attended. Before we sign off, I'm just going to share a few different links with you that we frequently get asked about. Um, so I'm putting those into the chat box. The first one is going to be a link to our Harmon Professional University. So you can go to there and register, and there's um, thousands of hours of curriculum content and certifications. All of that information is free. You just have to register. The second link I'm sending you is to our YouTube playlist. So every single one of these webinars is recorded and we put it out onto the playlist afterwards. So if you missed any of the sessions or if you wanted to review this one again, just go to the playlist, you can find it there. And then the third link is to the events calendar so that you can see all of the future sessions that are coming up. So um, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to either Stephen or myself. And thank you so much for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.